Det er den, der var det virkelig. Ja, så... Men skal vi ikke starte nu? Jo. Okay. Let's work on Mr. Gregas, who... Talk. Talk, and just talk. I've decided to be completely non-digital. So I'll just talk and wave my arms around and I have printed paper, which is a rather new invention. Um, my name is Gregus Peterson. Uh, by trade and profession, I'm an anthropologist. I, uh, I've been involved in this uh, environment for a while. I was for a couple of years on the board of the Danish BSD user group. Um, but I will not pronounce or say that I'm a technical person. I'm a fumbler. Um, and in this way, I'm, I'm also, uh, in terms of what I do right now, I'm a fumbler. I'm uh, conducting a research project which is focusing on um, the generation and creation and maintenance of property relations in the boundary zone between um, commercial companies and a specific free software project. So it's about construction of what is property and how is it negotiated in everyday life. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is sort of some th thoughts I've had on this thing on property. Uh, ownership, uh, value um, is an important thing, aspect. And my title is Open Source, is, is it something new? Uh, this is basically a rhetorical question because it's, it's from my point of view, it's, it's nothing new. The term open source might be a new term which has been produced or constructed in, as a result of certain intentions, relations, uh, history and a lot of individuals' interests and aims and a whole lot of things. I'm not going to go too much into it. But what it is, is it's uh, in a sense um, a representation of a very basic struggle in, in human culture. And I'm, I'm going to try to talk more generally about human culture. And what the struggle is about is it's a struggle about what is valuable, what is valued in our basic everyday life. What is like the foundation of, of how we understand the world and how we interact with each other. And this will uh, of course be me talking and I'll take uh, whatever I, I have on the shelves and in books and what I've heard other people say and I'm going to wrap it and beat it and pillage it and twist it and basically do whatever I want to do with it. So don't take anything what I say for being reality or real or objective or anything. <laughs> it's something which is my personal comments to a certain number of things. Uh, but it's also uh, a comment which is in a line that there are voices speaking out there that the open source mode of production will be the dominant mode of production in the post-capitalist society. So this whole idea of open sourcing, making things available, circulation, is part of a struggle between a, a present mode of production and present economical model, which is dominating our everyday life right now, and something which might be tomorrow. So we might be finding ourselves in a position of change, of, change, of transformation which again says it's, it's a significant struggle which goes on here. Um, and some of these, th some of the things that I'll keep referring to here are, are terms like uh, property, the state, mobility, nomadism, that we are mobile, that we move around, but also in the classical nomad uh, sense, sedentary life, that we are not mobile, um, I'll talk about circulation, I'll talk about knowledge. So I have some, some terms which will keep on popping up and disappearing again. And what is in, in this, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is tying it together is this basic concept of value. And uh, you might ask, um, what is it? What is value? And in that sense, uh, while I'm doing this, feel free to ask questions, just pop in. I have a question. Um, and I'm asking this question, what is value? Um, any of you thinking about what value is in your everyday life? Mm, a lot of people seem to think about it. Uh, you have at least 
three different notions of what, what value is. Um, there's a sociological sense that it's uh, what kind of forms our life, what makes uh, it, um, what structures it, what uh, indicates for us what is good, what is proper, uh, what is desirable in our everyday life. So that's one interpretation of, of emphasis of, of what value is. There's also a, a different one which is economically based. What is valuable in, in the sense of how much is it desired by somebody else and how much can we value it in monetary terms. But there's also a, a sense which I think to some extent in this context is quite interesting because it's, it's uh, the value which is placed into value, valuable relationships the relationships we have between each other, which are important to maintain, but we, not, we cannot value them as being uh, measurable in, in terms of money. Like, we have a relationship. We, we don't, but we could have one. In, in a sense, we probably have. Uh, I assume we are both BSD system users? Hmm? No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? I, was, I made an assumption. Um, but we could have been. Um, Maybe I will be. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we, we share something in common. Um, and this is important to both of us and to all of us that we share this thing in common. And we, we're not putting it into a spreadsheet and find out, okay, what's my profit on it? Uh, and uh, we're not saying that it's like something which, in a very specific institutionalized world sense, guides our life and what we do in our everyday life. So it's some, something different. And uh, you can say that uh, what is, I think what is here is, is one major struggle which goes on is, is this focus on economic value. That we are in our everyday life is measuring things in, in terms of money. Uh, and what we do there to make it possible to, to measure, to value something in terms of money, it's needed to take this product, this object we're talking about, and detach it from its producer or prior owner. It has to be alienated. It has to be ripped out of all these valuable relationships which it represents when it's still tied to its producer. It has to be free, flo free, uh, free floating so that it's possible to measure it in comparison with other objects and not as a product of social relationships. And um, this is, of course, uh, the paradigm of, of, of this present capitalist model, that things have to be made into objects which can be freely and undetached exchanged in relationships and transactions which are based on money. Um, and this was a little bit of a detour, but uh, what it points at is, is a very important aspect. This, and that is, it's also defining a very specific interpretation of what property is. And in this sense, property is something which is clearly tied to individuals. Individuals own something which they control completely. They are in control of what happens with this, pro with this object that they have bought or acquired or appropriated. And that's the whole basis of, of the capitalist economy. It clearly defines who owns what and who doesn't own what. This is mine, this is yours. I would like what you have, and especially if it's cheap and I can make money on it. Um, and but this also says, okay, so if this is one specific particular uh, interpretation of what property is, then okay, could it be that there are other interpretations? That there are other uh, modes of ownership? And uh, I thought, uh, as I wrote in, in this short brief on what I'm going to talk about in the program, what if I take like a little bit of a, a historic or prehistoric trip <laughs> So, uh, look at, okay, what is, uh, if I use this term property, what is, uh, how was it when it all began? And move, make a small move, and a very chaotic property one, to the present. 
And we can say, okay, what do we know about the property in the prehistory? Probably not much. We don't really know what people thought about. We have all these things that we can dig out. Uh, um, findings and remains and artifacts and some cave paintings and stuff like that. But uh, one specific thing which is quite interesting is that if we look at a archaeology, uh, an archaeological material, uh, we'll see that if, if we take like a time slice, we'll s it, it's quite obvious that you might have a couple of, 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 find, of uh, places where they found stuff, certain artifacts, thousands of kilometers apart, but they're actually quite identical. Uh, so, and there's been this, uh, there's been an old hypothesis that these prehistoric uh, nomadic hunter-gatherer societies were quite isolated small groups which had no idea about anything outside of their own little valley, which doesn't seem to be the reality. It actually seems to be that people and things and technology and ideas have been circulating across vast, vast continents. I think the best, uh, some of the best material is from uh, the period around the last ice age, where you have uh, tr something which assemble looks circulation networks, which spans the whole of the northern hemisphere. Because there was lots of ice and less water, so you could travel quite far, extensively. Um, and if you look at at the present day hunter gatherer people, which you see, we assume they are primitive. And as in that sense, they are representations of what we have been. They are still living in present day time, so it's kind of oxymoron, but still, uh, you can see amongst uh, some of these fairly socially, in, or in, in socially structured terms, uh, primitive groups, you can see that they have no specific sense of individual property. They have uh, lots of things they use. They have to carry them with them all the time, or they have them for a very short time where they fabricate them and then throw them away again. Uh, but they have certain things that they keep on with them during their nomadic lifestyle. Um, but uh, they, they're not owned individually. And one of the, there's a, a quite funny thing among, amongst a, a hunter-gatherer tribe in, in, from Tanzania called the Hatsa. Uh, who have a, a social structure which is based on demand sharing. You have to share. If you have something, you have to share. And to make this a, a nice, or, or, or it's, it, it's, it's my interpretation, to make it a more, probably a more positive approach, they are extre extreme degree gamblers. As soon as they have a minute, which they have quite often, hunter-gatherers have lots of spare time, they sit down and they gamble away everything they have. So it keeps circulating within the tribe, which I think is quite, it's quite fun. And at least it's a positive way of, of gambling. Because you can ensure that, okay, I might lose whatever I was carrying around right now, but I'll probably win it back tomorrow. But it's not mine anyway, so I don't really care. Um, and um, what is interesting here is that they have this demand sharing system where if you have something, you are demanded to share it. Somebody, everybody in the tribe can come up to you and say, I want my part of that meat you have. Okay, you have to cut it. And you cannot say, no, it's mine. Um, which is different from a very basic assumption about what actually keeps human society together. The normal, the, the more, uh, let's say, dominant assumption is that we are, base, we are basing our life on exchange, exchange of gifts. That's the basic foundation of social uh, structures. We have an exchange cycle. It's also called reciprocity. That you have an obligation that if you give a gift, you are you're, the receiver of the gift is obliged to take it, accept it. But uh, when you have given something, you're also obliged to receive again. So you have continuously exchange cycles where you give things back and forth across time and space. And uh, this goes on forever, in principle. And um, what is important here is the maintaining of a relationship. It's not, nothing about that I give you a cup which is worth 20 kroner, 
Uh, no, it's more that I give you a cup so you can drink of it and then you can give it back to me again and then I'm basically I have to give you something again because I got uh, and, and it goes. And that's the assumption that we are tied into these exchange constant and uh, replicating and self-building and, and self-maintaining and self-reproducing exchange networks which are the foundation of our social lives. But then again, exchange, when, as soon as we start in this sense to to be aware that we are exchanging something and, and we need to get something back again and the complexities of all this, then, then we suddenly have, a, if we go farther up into history, that uh, something interesting happens. Then, like if we look at the, the first written records, what are they about? I, I was thought, it's actually quite fun. They're about how much grain is in, the, is in this storage? Who owns what? Who's next in line? You know, we have these ancient clay uh, tablets from Sumer. They're all about something which is in the storage. They're all about things and who owns what and who's going to own what. So the, it's already at that point when you have like a, an emerging straight structure, it becomes extremely important to specify what is owned by whom. Where are the boundaries of what is mine and what is yours? Uh, where, is the boundaries, where is the boundary of our land and your land? And we want your land because it's next to ours and it should be, have been ours because and long discussions and wars. Um, and, but it also indicates something that it suddenly becomes an issue to control how things are circulating and keep things only accessible to certain people and not to everyone. And again, this concept of circulation and non-circulation starts emerging. And I think that's where I, I, I'm thinking about this, that open source is nothing new, is that it's, it's open source is about the circulation of things and knowledge and ideas and artifacts and that people have access to without anybody dictating that you are not old enough, you are too old, you are a man, you are a woman, certain basic things. Um, but that these things are, that information is, is circulating or it's not circulating. And in that sense, there's an emergence here of, of something which is probably, maybe it's a very important aspect in our basic culture is that there's um, a distinction in how knowledge is managed. Let's say you have these early and state structures which suddenly realize or it becomes evident that they are starting managing knowledge in a different way. It's not free for everybody to have access. And you can say it's not as we, as it quite often is talked about in, in Unix uh, context, that there is this guru over here, who will, he's he's going to help you because he's offering his knowledge away. You also have the Asian Asian guru, whose who, whose position uh, and uh, his the amount of respect which is around him is and his uh, his aim in life is to share as much as he can. And in, in that, in, in, um, in, in uh, what is it said, um, in contrast to this, you'll have a, a, a knowledge management model which is built on, on a magical conjurer, someone who keeps things secret. He hoards knowledge and he um, or she uh, doesn't give it away and they make their claim to fame by keeping things. So you have like a, several um, elements which kind of keeps on pointing towards this clash between circulation and non-circulation, between open and closed. And uh, I think uh, this is also tied into something with, with around the creation of, of this state as structure. Uh, which if you look, if you go back to 
one of the first uh, philosophers who thought about or made assumptions about the state was Plato. And he had this um, notion of the democratic state and um, what it should contain. And you had these philosopher kings, which should be like kind of guiding it. Uh, but the funny thing was that he actually also had a, a notion of, of uh, the ideal state, which funnily enough didn't have warriors, didn't have philosopher kings, didn't have all these people who actually kind of took the power and controlled the flow of information. Um, and, uh, but it still didn't hinder the, the development of these like first huge city-states and the whole first very large empires which culminated with the Romans. Uh, and what is significant about the Romans is that they made the decision the whole world as we know it is ours. Very cleanly cut. They, they only, luckily they only knew larger parts of Western Europe <laughs> and a part of Africa and so. But they declared it's ours. Uh, and um, everybody else doesn't own anything. It's Roman property. Um, and they are a lot, they like to build big cities. They were quite sedentary. They, and they, they weren't really into mobility in that sense. And uh, the funny part is that they got conquered and, and overthrown by hordes of mobile Huns and Visigoths and everybody started throwing themselves at the Roman Empire and, and kind of tore it apart and uh, created um, what is probably mostly well known as, as the Dark Ages, like the, like the early Middle Ages, before, years before the early Middle Ages, which are filled with all these groups of people who are roaming around and pillaging and stealing and raping and whatever they were doing. Um, but um, the thing was that they were quite mobile and they were, again, you had like a, a lot of flux of, of uh, knowledge and, and new technology which were being developed and a lot of new things happened. Uh, and in that way you can, you can look at these these mobile groups which are kind of exploring new possibilities and, and finding new land and so as, as kind of a cultural hackers. It's a misuse of the term hackers but uh, but then again you had these years, uh, several almost thousand years where not much really went on in terms of history writing. But um, then again <coughs> As uh, Umberto Eco writes in the name of the Rose, uh, the Holy Roman Church came about. <laughs> and they definitely know how to be in charge of knowledge. Um, and I think it's, it's very fun that he's, uh, Umberto Eco is using this, this uh, model that, okay, they know how to distribute knowledge. They put it into a secure library. Uh, they don't make copies. And they secure or ensure that the local data operators are blind. <laughs> uh, I think that's quite a fascinating way of, of ensuring that knowledge is not spread. But this didn't really work, this non-circulation of knowledge or circulation of knowledge amongst a very, very, very tiny group of individuals which definitely all were a member of the Roman Catholic Church and they were all probably monks. Uh, and. Uh, because suddenly somebody found out we can make a printing press, start printing. We can start circulating text um, and break this monopoly of the Catholic Church and a, a very elite group uh, with the introduction of the printing press. And um, at first it's probably about printing a Bible, the text of God. Uh, but it also quickly ended up with a lot of people starting printing books and texts where they asked themselves really silly questions like, is, if the earth is not flat, what is it then? Start, and started exchanging these ideas. And, um, and somehow this whole renaissance, uh, renaissance um, wave came along with uh, a lot of people exchanging new ideas and printing books and pamphlets and writing letters and you had like the emergence of quite efficient uh, postal services and um, 
they all had these things that they exchanged and talked and discussed. It might have taken five or six or ten years to to have a, a letter, like written letter discussion going on, but it, it still happened. And um, I have to admit I'm a, a big fan of Neil Stevenson. Um, so, and lots of strange things went on those days. And I thought I wanted to just read just a little snippet. Uh, and I'm probably not with, uh, I'm probably having some problems with copyright because I haven't asked to, to read a lot. So, uh, let's not talk about that. Um, but, um, this is just a short part about one of these, uh, let's say, scientific uh, settings in those days, uh, where one of the heroes of uh, Quicksilver, Daniel, comes to visit some of his friends who are uh, at Comstock's uh, castle. Um, and um, all of this was obvious enough for Daniel as one of Comstock's servants met him at the gate and steered him well clear of the manor house and across a sort of defensive buffer zone of gardens and pastures to a remote cottage with an oddly dingy and crowded look to it. To one side lay a spacious boneyard, chalky with skulls, skulls of dogs, cats, rats, pigs, and horses. To the other, a pond cluttered with wrecks of model ships, curiously rigged. About the well, some sort of pulley arrangement and a rope extending from the pulley across a pasture to a half-assembled chariot. On the roof of the cottage, there were small windmills of outlandish design. One of them mounted over the mouth of uh, the cottage's chimney and turned by the rising of its smoke. Every high three limb in the vicinity had been exploited as a support for pendulums and the pendulum strings had all gotten twisted round each other by winds and merged into a tattered philosophical cobweb. The green space in front uh, was a mechanical fantasy of wheels and gears and broken or never finished. There were was a giant wheel apparently built so that a man could roll across the countryside by climbing inside it and driving it forward with his feet. So you had a, a period there suddenly when, when people went, or some individuals, scientists, philosophers, uh, went crazy about stuff. They explored all kinds of ideas and they shared it. Very important that they shared and again shared their knowledge across vast distances. Um, and uh, these, these years were also uh, a period where it became even more important to, to find out what is mine and what is yours. Again, to identify property. Uh, and those, this was also a result of these emerging colonial empires, Western European empires in, in North and South America, Asia, Africa, the slave trade. Um, and uh, it made someone like Adam Smith ask themselves, okay, we have these new nations, how do we ensure their wealth, that they, be, that they prosper? And his answer was, of course, the free market, guided by this invincible hand, free invincible hand which guides it, kind of, a, again, uh, there's something there, not really, it's not just, we can't allow that it circulates completely free, we need something to guide it. Uh, to be sure that there's something which dedicates, dedicated, controls what is actually the value here. What is this about? We don't, we can't have it like everybody just agreeing or making their own points. We have to have somebody who's in charge somehow. Um, and uh, a part of this what else was also um, something which went on in these years that started out was uh, and an enclosure moment, movement. Uh, you had all, until the beginning of the 18th century, you had uh, vast uh, tracts of land and uh, resources which weren't really owned by anybody. They were like common. They were like, you had like common village fields. But then there started this enclosure moment where it became important to put up fences and clearly identifying who owns this field uh, you see it in North America, they suddenly started putting fences up across the prairie and quite odd but significantly important because it again identified what is my property? 
who, who is this belonging to? Because if you have a free market, it only works if you know who owns what, so who can sell what and who can buy what. I, I think that's kind of needed. You, you cannot have a free market if you don't know, if nobody owns anything, then there isn't a market. So the market is dependent on clear definitions of who owns what. And uh, this, of course, um, in this historical movement, uh, it's difficult not to talk about Marx. He had his basic uh, distinction between means and forces of production and relations of productions. So he says, okay, we have means and forces, we have what we're doing it with, land, natural resources, technology, which are necessary for the production. And then we have these relationships of, of uh, production, which are social and technical relations between people. Um, and again, property is still extremely important in this context, even for Marx. He's, he's relying that it's, it's possible to to identify individual property. And uh, there was one voice who raised and, and asked a very, very, or stated a very, very basic uh, comment. Uh, Proudhon said in uh, um, about the same time as Marx, property is theft. Individual property is theft. We have to recognize that what we're doing is a, a product of, of ourselves standing on top of uh, quite a number of giants but also millions of dwarfs. He didn't use those words but I think that's the sense of it that he's saying our ownership to things what is there is is product of uh, a generalized uh, human production so we cannot claim it for ourselves and as individuals. We can say it belongs to us. It belongs to humanity as such, and we can only reproduce it in terms of, of a mutual or collaborative ownership. Um, and I think in, that, in some ways this brings up, up to the title, this open source, this is something new. No, for me it's, it's not, if I look at this perspective, which has probably been slightly chaotic, um, but uh, it's not nothing new. It's, it's a reflection of a, a struggle between uh, individualized, highly controlled model of ownership and uh, like a multiple or a collaborative or a common model of ownership and recognizing it. And, and this again uh, points to what, what is actually valuable, what is the basic value in our everyday life. Is it something which can be measured in, in terms of, of money? Or is it something which we value in terms of the relationships we have to others and respect so it, these relationships and respect the work which has gone ahead of what we are doing? Again, respecting that we are standing on the shoulders of a lot of other individuals. And uh, so this, I think this again ties together that when we talk about value and property, I think we have to talk about something which is clearly tied into this whole construct of the state which we live in. This very specific state where we have a, a, a very few individuals who are in control of what is right and wrong and who owns what. Um, and uh, this might also be tied into a uh, question about is it something which is high, closely related to a, a sedentary lifestyle? like? which came out of uh, these, the invention of farming and, and the building of cities. Again, we, are, we may be living in a, in a, for some in a life situation right now where a lot of people are becoming much more mobile than they were just a few years ago. There's this sense of mobility. It might not be moving around that much, but we are mobile in a different way. Um, and definitely we are living in a, in a world where there is an immense explosion in the circulation of information and ideas and technology. And it's also a reality that it's driven by some new defined licensing schemes, whether VSD, GPL, or CC, or whatever. But that you had this formal reformulation of this idea that things 
is owned in uh, objects, uh, ideas are owned in a collaborative way or, uh, or uh, a common way in comparison to individual ownership, which seems, still seems to be, in economical terms, the dominant model. And uh, I think uh, the basic struggle here is, is, is a cultural struggle on, on is there, what is the basic value? Is that non-circulation? Is that keeping things like they are? Or is it circulation? Where knowledge is circulated and things keep changing all the time. And I think that's one of the where you can say that open source is, is in terms something new, but it's, it's also not. Um, and it also points to one very specific thing we should remind ourselves is that we have to recognize that we are standing on the shoulders of people and we owe them for what they did for us. So do we feel in ethical terms okay with taking what is actually their work and just appropriating and say it's mine and I don't care about it? I'll just do whatever I want. Can we do that? I think that's a significant question which is asked in terms of open source as concept. And I think that was uh, pretty much what I had to say. So feel free to ask questions. <laughs> and I think especially these questions, what did you actually say? Because <laughs> I, I can confuse myself on that. Mm. Um. It's quite true when you're talking like this in the term of open source that the BSD license is a... How does it fit in, fit in your picture? How the BSD license fit in my picture? I think... Um, Originally, I suggested that I wanted to talk about the BSD license, but it, I ended up talking about this instead of. I think the BSD license is, is in this sense, extremely interesting. Um, because it's, uh, if you look at it in, in comparison to other licenses, it's extremely free. It doesn't, it, in reality, it doesn't really uh, dictate anything else than don't claim that you made it. As long as you keep crediting whoever made it, you can do whatever. So in that sense, you would expect that this, if you look at it as a social model, wouldn't be reproduced. It's like there's no, like, you know, nobody's going to come and beat you up if you just make it into a closed product because as long as you kept saying, okay, I didn't make the original, but I'm not going to tell you what I did since the guy, you can understand me. So there is no like, in some sense, it, there isn't like anything which is controlling what you can do and what you can't do. So what is actually, how is the social system, the social society, the, the social institution which is relies on, how is this being reproduced? And I have to admit that I'm something somewhat of a, have somewhat a, of a, a question mark in that sense. Because uh, it seems to work. People are giving, you know, they're offering what they do for free. So it might be that they very clearly recognize that they're dependent on, on who came before them and who was who are coming after. But at the same time it's 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 also very difficult to to explain well, how it actually works. Yeah. Can I ask, or, uh, just as an aside, yeah. or make mm -hmm. a comment? In, in a certain sense, are you a developer? You've been around the. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you're obviously here contributing your time. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, in I'm, terms I'm, of contributing uh, things like source code to the project, you've really gone through that process? Uh, not really. I've, I've contributed uh, documentation. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's see. There, mm -hmm. there, there's something. Mm. Uh, I, I would argue, and, and I think that this is sometimes very personal for a lot of different people, mm -hmm. developers, mm -hmm. to kind of it, take a, maybe the dot off question mark at least, mm -hmm. is uh, uh, there's a certain kind of love and passion for 
the work. There's a, a, a kind of a, a love for the technology and good stuff, making stuff. Um, a kind of a passion for what you're doing. It's more important than uh, sometimes the work, recognizing how many people have come before and the shoulders of all the giants are standing on. Mm -hmm. And what that's, how, how wonderful experiencing all of that is in their mm -hmm. creative lives, uh, working with critics and BSD. Mm -hmm. That it's, it's to me and to a lot of people I know, very simple to explain because it's a it's a guarantee of the continuation of the work. The self is like the individual and the self is far less important than like hacking more, uh, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so the value ends up being in the thing living. So if that manifests, if that means that it goes and mm -hmm. lives in mm -hmm. commercial products, uh, there's a sense of knowing enough history of where things have come from to know that it, it, it's going to come out the other side somewhere and benefit someone else. You know, and if it doesn't, it doesn't matter because it will at least keep going mm. somewhere. So, in some some sense, you are you're saying that there are different imp interpretations of what work is. Yeah. Yeah. And what which, value is. Yeah. Is which is clear. Is. Yeah. I'm, I completely agree. There are numerous distinctions in terms of, of what work is, uh, and you know. There is a continuous discussion within anthropology. What is work? One example is that. Okay, work is something which you you make money on it, but it can all, likely as well be something which is all about reproducing the well-being of your family. In but the well-being of your family as being the this extended kin system which expands 27 islands and contains 20,000 people of whom you have only met 27. So that's a different, complete different notion of, of, of work, which is far more close to what you're saying. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I think maybe Ivan in his talk earlier mm -hmm. about how, why they uh, release some of their work mm -hmm. also has a point. Mm -hmm. That simply it's, it's easier if you also have other people to help maintaining your work and mm -hmm. manage that by releasing it as a part of the common Mm. Yeah. The, the very first uh, reason why we do contribute, as I said, is just to avoid other people uh, working against us, even if they don't know that uh, they're doing. Mm. They don't know they're working against us, but that they are, that's what they are doing, or mm. perhaps uh, they are working again against us, perhaps we are working against us, uh, that's difficult to mm. point of view. But uh, yes, uh, I think that you worry the, the better than it to make things uh, easier to, to, to avoid wasting time. Yeah, this question about avoid waste, wasting time, but it all, might also be that uh, you just avoid that other people are waste, wasting their time with doing something which you already did. So that you're actually deciding, okay, I might as well help whoever, I don't know them. I have no idea if they're out there, but if I release my idea and my code, then it might actually help somebody else with doing what they're doing, without me having to have a relationship with them at all. Yeah? Because it doesn't matter if you do your work because you have this passion for this set of coding, and you have to make a decision. You can keep it up for yourself or release it mm -hmm. yeah. for others, and that's yeah. mm -hmm. independent of Mm -hmm. Your style of work, or what mm -hmm. makes you work? Yeah, because you can say that with with this releasing a knock, yet you can say, okay, you will never lose the credits. You're always going to be the one or uh, one of the ones who <coughs> coded the thing. When you talk about source code, but uh, and you can keep it, and you can hold it, and you can have it on your hard disks, hard drives at home, and no, I just did the best thing in the world, but. If you just keep it there, it doesn't really make much sense. It makes sense to you, but it, it doesn't really make sense in, in social terms. So if you want to make, go into a process of, of making sense of your own work, then you kind of have to release it. You have to make it public. You have to have friends and peers and enemies uh, look at what you're doing and maybe say, okay, it's, it's actually, I don't like it, but it works. <laughs> So I'll use it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah? This um, 
to talk about uh, ownership as yeah. uh, uh, there can be uh, ownership in the sense that one person owns something like the money in your pocket. Yeah. And uh, no ownership like nobody owns the universe. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but is it a, a, a continuum? Uh, uh, I own something, my family owns something, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. city, the country, the mm -hmm. yeah. humanity. <laughs> mm. I think uh, your question about how ownership is understood is uh, a question of uh, do you incorporate obligations in relationship to ownership? Like I can say um, one example, I, I've uh, written these uh, documentation, pages of documentation for our project uh, and um, I, I have, they are on my copyright and by saying that, okay, you are, you can spread them as you want to, but you have to remember to give me, to mention that I was the original author of them. Uh, and, but one of the obligations which is there is that, okay, if you want to make major changes, it would be quite normal to maybe send me an email and say, hey, uh, I have a, I'm planning to wipe all what you did and replace it with something new. Uh, how do you think about that? Will you put some comments into that? So that you kind of have this obligation that you, you ask someone if you are going to make a major rewrite, if that other person is still active. Uh, okay, should we work on this together? Uh, what can I do and what can't I do if I want to keep this line moving? Um, so in that sense you have a lot of different ways of understanding ownership. But what, what is interesting right now is that in this present day and time is that you have a very, very narrow dominant model of ownership which is focused on this individual ownership to very, very specific things which are completely controlled. You don't have any obligations. Like if you buy a, a chair you don't, the, you don't ask the manufacturer if you can repaint the chair when you get it home. But if you had a different notion of, of ownership, you would maybe have to, or you will be obliged to ask the producer of that chair if it's okay to paint it red. Yeah? If you take a step into, say, art, mm -hmm. uh, you could not, I mean, it would be kind of not um, very popular to change a Van Gogh. Even though you own it, you know mm -hmm. you, you're, you, you, you're owning it, and you yeah. bought it, yeah. but you couldn't just repaint it because you mm -hmm. like the roses to be a rose pink yeah. or whatever. But but that again, art is is actually very very complex because on one hand you own it, but it's also uh, something which you it's an investment object. You know, you expect when you buy it, you'll expect that you sell it for more when at least if if you don't, something went wrong with your investment. Uh, but you also have this thing that you once in a while you hear these stories about this old Japanese man, he wants to be buried with his paintings or uh, cremated with them and he has like four Picassos and eight Van Goghs and whatever. Uh, which is, when you hear it, completely unacceptable for a lot of people. But I think that's actually, if, if you look at, at uh, the the logic of, of our society, would it, why is that unacceptable? And which again is this, you have like some common history or biography which belongs to humankind which is supposed to be commonly owned or commonly accessible, accessible but it breaks with a lot of other logics which are, are pushed. So you have these like zones where different logics are, are operating and Somehow they, some of them get maintain, are maintained and, and some of them break down. Hmm? Also a lot of the thoughts you know, around the, about the open source and other mm -hmm. uh, movements uh, kind of assume that everyone acts in a philanthropic way mm -hmm. to the best interests of the commons. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what happens then? You know, if you take it to the extreme, uh, the anarchists mm -hmm. They say that you need no government, everyone does that as well. Well, what happens then if one bastard decides that he wants to rule everyone else? You cannot stop him because there is no government. 
So, if, if, if you, you get my point, that uh, there is definitely a problem here because you cannot necessarily assume that everyone is acting in a philanthrop uh, philanthropic and decent way. Mm -hmm. In exactly. fact, history has gone over and over again to prove mm -hmm. that most, mm -hmm. many people are not mm -hmm. decent, mm -hmm. very decent. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. there's definitely a clash here. So. There are lots of clashes. And, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not saying that I have a solution for anything. <laughs> I'm just pointing. Yeah? We just talk about buying things and uh, guess we could uh, sell them at a higher price, price after. I think, I think uh, contributing to open source programs is something near like that because uh, I consider I bought some ownership for some projects, not by paying them, but by, work, but by spending time on them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm quite sure my main motivation is just having them getting a higher value in the future. Not to sell them, of course, uh, not myself, my company is not a problem, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to have them uh, more interesting, more efficient, more, more reliable, mm -hmm. more, more everything. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not the same because we don't want to sell them, but mm -hmm. We there's the same idea because we want them to 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 get a higher value. Mm. Value but not, it's not yeah. the same no. version. But I think again, uh, what you're talking about is this buying and selling uh, metaphor. Is is uh, again something where you have to recognize as being something different. You're not talking about capital, but you're talking about social capital. So, which is. And social capital is not really something which you can value in terms of money, but you can still make things happen with it. You know? And you can, you can concentrate it and you can, you can put it into something like your project, which is a representation of social capital. Like, you know, if, you are, if you're doing good work and you've been doing it for a long time, and invested a lot of hours, you actually, uh, you, you'll be able to, to ask others to help you in certain situations. Like because you have a your representation of, of social capital. Hmm? If that was a comment to your question? Hmm? I think we are about there.